Well, it finally happened after buying and selling over 40 cars, I've come across a car that I have completely undersold. On this episode of Eat Sleep Drive, I'm gonna show you guys why I sold this car for way less than I should have, and we're also gonna go over how much it cost me to own an Evo 9 for a year. Welcome everyone to another episode of Eat Sleep Drive. I'm sitting down for this one because I'm kicking myself. I sold this car too cheap. Behind me is my 2006 Mitsubishi Evolution, also known as the Evo 9. And today is kind of a sad day because it's going to its new owner. I've really loved this car. I've had it for about a year and it was like really a high school dream car of mine. It's been so fun to own and drive, but I'm always looking for the next adventure with cars. You guys know that on this channel. So it's going to a new owner. But the thing that I'm really mad about is that I undersold it. I got so much interest in this car and I'll give you guys all the details on how to not do that when, you come, when it comes time for you to sell your car. But also what we're gonna do is talk about how much it cost me to own this thing. If you're curious about owning an Evo 9 and some of the costs associated with it, this car had three issues that when I purchased it, I inherited and I ultimately fixed and have helped me with the resale value of the car. So we'll talk about those three issues, how much it cost to fix, how much I bought it for and how much I'm selling it for. So let's, get, uh, let's dive in to the first issue. Far and away the biggest issue I had with my Evo when I purchased it is that on cold starts, it idled like an absolute dog. <laughs> Uh. This car has 1200 cc injectors, which are really very, very large. And that's because it runs E85. And when you run E85, you have to put in a lot more fuel into the engine than running just big regular 93. But the problem with um, going with like bigger injectors and also this, this engine has cams and stuff, it can be tricky to get to idle properly. And this car, once again, on a cold start was just horrible. It stumbled around forever. Once you got it warmed up, it was totally fine. Idled great, but cold start, it was a pain. You had to feather the throttle all the time and everything like that. What was really crazy about this issue is that it was the simplest fix ever. I made a video on it, but you can see behind this catch can, see this guy right here? Stock, these cars have a resistor pack on the firewall for the high impedance injectors. And I actually said that word right this time. I said it horribly wrong in the last video. But the aftermarket injectors, at least in this case, were low impedance. And the problem with having like this resistor pack for a high one stock and then low here, I don't know all the like total specifics, but fortunately I have a tuner friend that helped me out. And he said that as long as you change or bypass that resistor pack, you should be good to go um, from idling at a cold. It basically has to do with how stable the injectors are, which I think is, is really crazy to me. And I was like, well, I'll give it a shot because this little bypass piece is like $20 and I bypassed it and instantly the car ran better. Like the cold start is completely fine now. I don't have to feather the throttle. It idles absolutely perfectly. So I actually got really lucky with that because I was originally thinking that maybe I would need new injectors. Maybe I would need to get the car retuned by my tuner. And I was gonna go down that path, but trying that $20 fix first was really a huge savings for me. And the biggest issue that I solved quite quickly actually. The next issue with the car wasn't mechanical at all. It was actually cosmetic and it had to do with the exterior of the car. When I purchased this car, it looked like it had been through 500 washes with like your bath towel. The worst wash etiquette ever. There was swirls everywhere. The paint was so rough and it really took away from an otherwise beautiful car. It just really needed a quality, quality detail. Now, I can do a decent job washing a car, but I do not have the skills to 
polish a car without ruining it. It's very easy to screw up a detail job. So I took it to a professional and this is where I spent a lot of money. I spent $800 on a paint correction. Uh, that included some other things, but the main thing was they spent hours correcting this paint. And I'll show you guys now. I mean, this thing looks incredible now. It's a little bit dusty, but it shines now. He, they, the detailer actually got the flake back in this paint. I don't know if you could see it on camera. And once again, the car's a little bit dusty, but there was no flake in this paint before when I purchased the car. And it looks like a completely different color now ever since they detailed it. So not only did they give me, um, or not only did I get the detail for the $800, but they also buffed the headlights, which are in a horrible state and they applied clear bra to them. So they should be good forever. But you know, that's not a mechanical thing. And you could say, well, you know, you can still sell a car if it's not in the best condition exterior wise and stuff like that. But getting this in a professional detail really made my pictures pop. And that's definitely what goes a long way when it comes time to selling a car. And I got a lot of interest when I finally did post it. We'll get into a little more of that in a minute, but let's cover the last issue I had to fix with this thing. Now, the last issue I had to deal with with this car was a pesky SRS airbag light. Right here under the tarmac gravel snow options on the gauge cluster, I was just every time I would start the car and drive it, I was getting an SRS airbag light and I had no idea how my OBD2 scanner, which is a scanner you plug in, typically reads like engine codes and stuff, didn't read that kind of stuff. And I was really scratching my head as to like what the problem was because this car's never been in an accident. All the airbags are intact and all that stuff. So I finally got around to going to my buddies at Turn In Concepts in Cincinnati, Ohio. They're my favorite tuning shop in the area and they do some great work. But fortunately, they also have a very expensive scanning tool. There's a snap-on scanning tool that will be able to read not just engine codes, but also airbag codes. The scanning tool is like $3,000, so that's not really something I wanna purchase. But fortunately, they hooked me up and for a very small fee, uh, they told me that it was related to the uh, seat belt. I forget exactly the code. It was like a seat belt code, which didn't make sense because I have seat belts clearly and I was buckling my seat belt and everything. But one thing I did notice is that when I would put my seat belt on or off, I was not getting a light up here on the gauge cluster. So I thought that was kind of weird. And I dug into it and lo and behold, under the seat, there was a little plug under here that was not plugged into anything. And turns out that was supposed to go to the seatbelt buckle itself, which didn't have a plug at all. And these seats are actually from a Evo MR. Um, the stock seats are SE seats and they have red stitching. So these are actually not seats from the original car. And it seems like at some point somebody swapped in a belt buckle that didn't have the appropriate uh, what's the word for it? Appropriate wiring for the sensor and everything like that. It looks like it was just like some one from a passenger seat or something that doesn't have that plug. But anyway, long story short, I replaced the belt buckle with one that does have the wiring, as you can see, plugged it in and the code went away. I'm so, so thankful for that because I was worried that I was gonna have to chase down all kinds of crazy things trying to fix this SRS airbag light. Now, of course, we're getting to the part where I screwed up. Let's first talk numbers. I did the $800 detail in between fixing or bypassing the injector resistor and also having the belt buckle airbag light fixed. That was another hundred bucks. So I'm in this thing 900 bucks additional to the 1700 roughly that I paid for the car. So give or take 18 grand all in. I'm not including insurance and stuff like that that you would have on any car, of course, but $1,800 I'm in all in on this car. Now I have seen the market on these go up, especially as of the last year. If you look on Bring a Trailer, these cars like low mileage examples are going for above what they were the cost new. So clearly these are going to be collectible in a, you know, some time frame and they're already done depreciating and they're starting to appreciate. So I knew that I could probably get a little more than I had into the car. Plus it's fully sorted now. It drives absolutely great, pulls super strong and it is totally rust free, which is something that is very rare for an Evo. 
So I knew all this going in and I was looking at the market on Facebook Marketplace and bring a trailer and stuff like that. And I thought I could maybe get 20 grand for the car. See, despite the fact that this car is in fantastic shape, super clean, runs, drives great, fully sorted, it does have 129,000 miles. And miles don't mean a whole lot to me. You guys may have seen my 140,000 mile GTR video that I just did. As long as a car has been maintained, it doesn't bother me at all. But a lot of people are afraid of mileage. So I was worried that people are gonna say, oh, the mileage is too high, I'm not interested in it. It's got almost 130,000 miles. So I priced it just under 20 grand. And within, seriously, seconds, people were lighting up the Facebook ad. I posted it on Evolution M, which is a Evo forum. I posted it on Craigslist and I posted it on Facebook. And I've never had more interest in a vehicle. And that's when I knew I screwed up. I priced this car way too low because I have people literally lined up to pay asking price for this car, which is a problem I've never ever had before. I've never sold a car for asking price. So that leads me to believe that I priced the car too low. I definitely could have got more for this car, at least 22 grand. There, there's just not many that are in this condition that drive this good and stuff like that. But anyway, I clearly priced it too low and within seriously a half an hour, somebody had already put a deposit down on it. This was yesterday and they're coming to pick it up today. So the lesson to this is do not price your car too low. Whatever you think it's worth, maybe just bump it up two grand because then you can always come down. You can never go up in price. You can only come down. And don't do like I did and think like, oh, if the mileage is too high or whatever, if it's a good clean car, don't sell yourself short like I did. So all in, um, you know, netting around two grand on this car, give or take, and I got to own it for a year. I'm, I'm super stoked. I'm, I'm elated to be able to do that. And it just shows that if you guys pick the right vehicle, one that is appreciating value or at least leveled off, you can basically own fun sports cars for close to free outside of gas and insurance, like things like that. So I hope you guys enjoyed the video. I hope you found it informative. I'm gonna miss this car, but you guys should be excited for what's gonna come next. There's always another car around the corner on this channel. Appreciate you guys watching as always. Eat, sleep, drive TV on Instagram. I'll see you guys on the next one.